Hello and welcome to the Alpha Anywhere demo and Q&A webcast. I'm Dave McCormick, VP of Product Management here at Alpha Software, and I'm pleased to be joined by Sarah Mitchell, Head of Documentation. Sarah will be giving our presentation today, and she's going to be talking about component types. And it's about time because we do get an awful lot of questions about when people start building out their applications, what types of components should they be using? And uh, here, Sarah is here to demystify that for you. But we're also here, of course, to answer your questions. And you can submit those questions by typing them into the questions box of the GoToWebinar control panel. So let's get started. Uh, hello, Sarah. I can see your screen there. OK, great. And I can hear you. So that's all good. Awesome. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. I know we mentioned last week we're going to get back to the basics. And uh, uh, today is one of those. Uh, Basic lesson day. So um, some of you who have been around here for a while, this is going to be review. Um, so maybe you'll learn something new. I hope everyone learns something new. And then for those of you who are new, welcome. I'm glad to have you here. And I hope that this information will give you uh, some decent foundation for uh, starting, starting your applications. Uh, before we get into that, just a reminder, DevCon is coming up and you can register online at www.alphasoftware.com slash DevCon 2021. We have a exciting lineup uh, for this multi-day conference this year. I hope everyone can join us. Uh, it is digital, it'll be recorded. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited for that. And it's coming soon. We're already halfway through July. So September, October, August, September, October. It's not that far away, is it, Dave? Maybe three months. It's not far at all. Yeah. No, no. Time to buckle down and uh, yeah, get moving on that. So today we're going to talk about components in Alpha Anywhere, um, and uh, we're going to talk about what what these different types of components are, and what one you should consider using uh, for your apps, the type of apps you want to build. So Alpha Anywhere applications, uh, just as a review, uh, they're created with components, and components are uh, these files uh, specific to Alpha Anywhere uh, in which that you build your UI layouts and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, Alpha Anywhere has five, at this point, I consider these five core components that we really uh, focus on, even though there were a lot more on that previous slide. Um, these are the five main ones uh, that most people use. And even within these five, uh, most people don't use some of them. So uh, those core components are the UX component, the grid component, the tabbed UI builder slash component, uh, the login component, and the app launcher. So I wanted to just sort of go over what each one of these component types are uh, today uh, and what types of apps they are best used for. And we're going to start with the grid. And the grid is a component in Alpha Anywhere that's been around for a while. Um, and it's it's predominantly predominantly used in web apps. Uh, desktop users can also use them. Um, they're not good for mobile. They don't support mobile interaction. But uh, if you're looking into a web app and you've got a SQL database backend that you want to add a user interface to, either to you know search a, a customer database or provide a way to maintain product information, a grid is actually a very good choice. Uh, it provides functionality for searching, creating records, updating records, deleting records, and also reviewing your data. It has some action JavaScripts for performing common operations. And it's one of the two component types that you can create using the Flying Start Genie if you need to get started quickly um, and uh, have a, a, a lot of tables that you want to build off of. Um, we do recommend using SQL for any new applications that you build. Uh, for those of you who have been around for a while, you may still be using DBFs. Um, the grid can connect with both DBS and SQL databases, as well as some other data sources. Um, interestingly, it can only connect with one. Um, so keep that in mind if uh, needing to pull from multiple data sources is a need of yours in your applications. Along the same vein of web applications is also the tabbed UI. It is also for creating web apps. It's not really suitable for mobile. Uh, the tabbed UI is a tabbed 
visual interface, it creates a layout where you can tap on menu items on the left or right hand side, wherever you position it. And then you click on those items, you can do things like open a component, display a report, open a PDF, open other HTML or A5W pages, uh, and so on and so forth. This is also a component that you create with the Flying Start Genie. Um, and we can take a look at the Flying Start Genie later. Uh, a side note here is that the UX control actually can be used to create a very similar interface to the tabbed UI, uh, if not an identical interface, um, which leads me into the next component I wanted to mention, the UX. The UX control, by and large, is great for both web and mobile. It has over 100 controls to choose from. Actually, you sat down and counted them the other day, and I was a little, little, little mind-boggling to think about that. Uh, the grid and tabbed UI, not so much. Tabbed UI, you can insert like buttons and links. The grid, you can choose the type of control that your data can be edited with, but um, you don't have you don't have a lot of variety in that. So by and large, the UX has the most to choose from. Uh, it can also integrate with multiple data sources. With the tabbed UI, you are limited to a single table on the back end, or if you've written a um, created a view or um, even a stored procedure in your database, that can also go, uh, the grid can, component can go against those types of data sources. But with the UX, you're not limited to a single table or a single database. You can integrate multiple databases, multiple tables, multiple data sources. You can pull down from a web service or um, MongoDB, you can also um, display data from DBS if that's a choice of yours. It includes offline support, which is why it is great for mobile. In fact, it's the only component you can use to build mobile. Um, it has a massive selection of action JavaScript that you can use. It is compatible with our alpha launch and alpha shell products for testing your applications. And you can also build Cordova apps with it. And as I mentioned before, it's, it's really the only control you can use for building mobile. Um, so those are three main ones. Um, login component you may have seen on that screen. There is actually two types of login components with Al in Al Alpha Anywhere. There's the old one that's been around forever uh, that is not available in Community Edition, and we actually do recommend that you do not use that one when you create a, a login interface. We recommend using the UX control, either using one of the templates or the new specialized UX that you can generate using the login option as of a recent release. And this specialized UX includes features like forgot password, registering uh, two-factor authentication. All this stuff has been integrated for you. It's very new. It was added within, uh, I think, a couple weeks ago, two weeks ago, uh, when we put out the most recent release. And it's great for adding a login interface for both your web and your mobile applications. So it's a UX component but I'm making a special call out here for login because it is generated for you when you pick the login option here. Uh, this is actually a simplified screenshot of the new component tab, uh, not tab, window when you add a new control. Uh, login is one of those options and you can now generate a UX that has all those things for you, all the code and everything. There's a little bit of extra work you have to do to get it hooked up and working with your app. But uh, we've added that for you, and we're hoping moving forward that this will become uh, a great way for people to add uh, security, get the framework in there, and have uh, authentication in front of their application access. So the last one I've included here, um, I've included because we make it available in Community Edition, and it does still have some value, but by and large, the approach of using the app launcher for um, Shipping a, a web app or a mobile web app is is not commonly used anymore. Um, the The premise behind the app launcher is when someone comes to your website and we serve up the app launcher, the app launcher does a little bit of investigation to figure out what type of device they are using. And then based on that criteria, decides what component or URL to serve up for your application. So really common practice is to have www.my website.com as your main desktop site and then to have like a slash mob mob mobile sort of um, secondary site that you give to people who are browsing in a web application uh, on a mobile device so that you could provide a different experience tailored to their screen size so 
the app launcher is uh, is in there, and if that's how you want to build a, a web a website and a mobile web app, basically uh, for your uh, project, uh, that's available to you. Um, note that the UX can be used uh, instead with like a responsive UX design layout where you use panels, uh, or even go as far as to do the detection yourself on the login, and then serve up the the component uh, that you would want the customer to ex uh, use for the experience of their device. So on all these slides, uh, I mentioned web, I mentioned mobile, and in terms of starting with the new app or even moving forward with an existing app uh, and you want to make a portion of it mobile friendly, uh, here's uh, a very easy way to decide what you're going to use. If you're going to build a web app, the UX component, by and large, I think, is a great place to start. Uh, if you prefer the simplicity of the grid, that is also a very acceptable solution. Uh, login component for adding your login uh, to keep things simple. And then the tabbed UI as an option if you want that tab layout makes it very easy to do. Now, you can accomplish all the things in the tabbed UI with the UX, but some people may find it easier to work with the tabbed UI, and that's perfectly fine. I encourage you to take a look at these options for when you're going to build a web web app and to pick the one that most closely design, uh, fits the design that you're aiming for. So if you've got a web application that's going to have a lot of columns and uh, containers and that kind of thing, you might want to stick with the UX uh, because of the panel layouts or even containers and the tab interfaces within it that you can build uh, that make that pretty simple to put together. If you want to do more of a tabbed interface, tab UI is a great place to start. And also the Flying Start Genie can get you started really, really fast if you just need grids, um, some sort of basic backend app for database management or customer management or whatever you need. On the mobile side, you have to use the UX component. Uh, and the login component uh, that we generate now with the UX is also great uh, for those two options. So uh, that first slide, you may have seen there were a lot more component types to choose from. Um, and these are older components that existed before Alpha Anywhere. They've been around for a while. Uh, they, they tell a little bit of the story about how Alpha Anywhere has evolved over the years. Um, and uh, they're also, uh, they're not available in Community Edition. So if you're using Community Edition, you won't have access to any of these component types. Uh, but there's a good reason for that. And that is because all of them can be created with the UX. And if you create them with the UX, you can use them in a mobile environment. Uh, by and large, the custom component maintenance navigation system, these are designed for web application usage. Uh, they're not going to work well on mobile. Image gallery, kind of, if you've got an iPad, maybe. Um, but all of these are easily replaced with the UX component. And so I just wanted to go over uh, what those replacements look like for those of you who may have these and are thinking about updating your apps, upgrading your apps, or maybe just haven't thought about how the UX could possibly help you in these situations. So we're just gonna go through that list, top to bottom, page layout, all the way to image gallery. Uh, the first one, page layout builder, is really just a grid-like layout. Um, you can use panels and containers on a UX component to accomplish the same thing to embed your controls. So that's, uh, that's one way to think about it. And with the UX, you can embed pages, reports, so on and so forth. So that's that's all supported in there. A custom component, UX component. The custom component is really for advanced developers. Um, and some of the stuff it might offer, uh, it might seem like it's easier to do with a custom component if you have a lot of work with it. But definitely go check out the UX component. And within the UX component, check out the custom control that we have in there, the view box, which is highly customizable. Uh, these things might offer you more control and uh, certainly might be easier to snap into other applications, uh, whereas a custom component may not work as well as you'd hoped. Uh, the navigation system is a menu, uh, like a horizontal menu. You click on a button, it displays a drop down of choices. Uh, Tab UI is a good replacement for that with a column on the side of menu options. Of the UX, you can accomplish the same thing with control bars and panels or a tab control. Uh, the expanding menu control gives you that sort of drop down menu system that you get with the navigation system component. 
excuse me. Uh, so that's um, it's another way to uh, see, rethink that. Um, Google Map component is just a map control in a UX. And I would argue that a, a map control in a UX gives you more control than the Google Map component does, uh, specifically when you start thinking about things you want to do with it, uh, plotting uh, routes and that kind of stuff. It's easier to do in a UX than it is to do with the Google Map component. Uh, same thing with the video player component, it plays a video. Uh, the UX control or component has a, a lot of different video players to choose from, including some that are mobile friendly, some that can do uh, recording. So highly recommend using the video player on, in the UX rather than using the video player component. We have a calendar component that displays data as a calendar. We do have a calendar control in the UX and it can be a little bit, mm, I don't wanna say complicated, but it's not straightforward to set it up. Uh, but I also wanted to mention that the calendar, uh, the list has a calendar view. It's still in beta testing. And if people are interested in uh, trying that out, uh, fair warning, it's, when I say beta testing, it's predominantly code to set it up right now, but uh, that's been in beta for a while, but we'd like to have more feedback on that. And, and ultimately at the end of the day, what that's gonna give you is a way to just render your list data as a calendar instead of a, a Kanban or um, a freeform layout. And it has a lot of stuff that you can do with it, including um, display a very Google Calendar-like interface with um, events that span multiple days, clicking and dragging things. So it's very cool. I'm hoping that uh, soon maybe we'll start to see some movement on that and get closer to a, a final release for it. But uh, definitely check that out if you are a Calendar component user. And then also image gallery. Not as straightforward, there isn't a specific image control that replaces this in the UX, but you can do it with a list. So your your images are a list of URLs or something, and that's your data for your list control, and then you display them in some sort of grid or in a view box, and then when you select it, you can display it as a larger image. So those are two very good options as replacements. And then the last one, which you have seen, uh, some people probably know about the maintenance component. This is very strictly for DBFs. Uh, you can create a maintenance component that lets you do the things, or create a UX component that lets you do the things that the maintenance component allows. Uh, but we are strongly encouraging people to migrate to a SQL database, uh, especially if you want to take your DBF data from a desktop environment and go on the web. And that's just because SQL databases work so much easier with web apps, uh, they're more reliable and faster, and there's just a lot of bonuses to have there that DBFs can't offer you. So if that's a thing that you're looking to replace, maybe you should consider also migrating your SQL or migrating your data to a SQL database. And there are databases out there that are free. Uh, I believe MariaDB is one, uh, MySQL, uh, so on and so forth. So. Very short, uh, I did mention the Flying Start Genie. Uh, I'm gonna launch Alpha anywhere here and we'll go take just a, uh, you know, let's do full version today. Let me see if I can find it. Launch. Oh, hold on a sec. I need to run the, the pre-release because it's got some features in it. Apologies, uh, maybe while I am trying to find which one of these is the one I want to use, uh, Dave can look at the questions and see if there are any that people have about uh, components. Uh, there were, and one was about the Flying Star Genie, which you're going to get into, which is terrific, mm -hmm. just sort of like, what yep. is it? Um, yeah, it's not a component. One, <laughs> another one I'm going to bug you with later, because I because it'll be a little bit of a JavaScript coding example. Um, Ooh, ah, here's one which is how do you convert from the legacy login to the new UX version? So they have um, found that difficult and is there documentation for doing it? There's no conversion documentation. You basically have to just recreate it using the new one. Yeah. Um, there's no, there's no like upgrade path for that because they're very different. Uh, but I'd be interested to, to know what they've- but it's still, at done. the same side, it still yeah. uses 
same security framework. So it does. It uses the that, same security framework. That, so your pages that are relying on the security framework don't really change very much. It's the login that changes the most, I would say. Oh, uh, no. Hold on. Yep. I just need to make sure I didn't do the thing I was told not to do. <laughs> So if just as an FYI, we have this big statement this morning. It says build 7777,007s has an error uh, <laughs> that prevents UX components from working. But this is 78. Uh, so uh, let's find out. <laughs> so yeah, I mentioned the flying start genie. So I just wanted to show where um, basically where everything is uh, and double check which one did I launch. All right, so this is the full version of Alpha Anywhere. I had mentioned the Community Edition users. When you click this new button and you go through Web Component, which is everything we talked about today, you are not going to have Page Layout Builder or Custom Component or Google Map or Video Player or any of those. Um, you also, I don't believe you have Hide Legacy component, Components, which we are not going to talk about. Don't use them. Um, and, and if you do have them, there there are ways to upgrade and definitely send us an email if you need help for with that uh, but uh, the flying start genie isn't in there it's up here on the front and this uh, may not seem super useful once you dig into it but if you've got a lot of, of tables that you want to build an app against and you just want to explore the data uh, and maintain it I'm gonna uh, you can use the flying start genie to create just a whole bunch of grids for it that puts it in a layout and then you can go and look at your data. So the way this works is on this step one, connect to database, uh, you have to pick a SQL database. I'm going to use the demo Northwind connection string. If you don't have this one, there will be a link somewhere on here that you can click to generate it. I'll click next. Uh, after that, I'm going to turn off views. I don't want views. You then pick all the tables that you want an interface for. Products, shippers, suppliers, skipping these other ones. And then you click next. And then you can optionally change some settings. When this goes through, it, it automatically makes every grid editable, which means you can change the data. It only shows the first five fields. But you could make that bigger if you wanted. And it prefixes every grid with a name, and that name is auto. Uh, I do like to come in here when I use this and just name it after whatever connection string or database uh, that I'm going against, just so I know what those are. Uh, and then um, you can also pick a different style here. I'm going to go in here and pick alpha or SAS themes here. Uh, if you've never used this before, I believe this defaults to the alpha theme. And then there's a few other things here where you can you can put some you can change the default text that's in the header and footer of the tab UI, uh, the con padding around some container classes and stuff like that. So and if you click next, it's going to tell you everything that it's going to generate, and it will do this uh, in Community Edition. It will publish the files in the Live Preview folder and open it. So if we click finish here. Uh, do I want to save these settings? Not today. Let's let that run. It's going to make eight grids for me and a tab UI and then publish them to localhost and then open the browser and show us what we uh, what we generated. But um, some really cool things that this does when it sets up your grids is it if the if it's coded in there, it identifies foreign key relations. So you can actually you actually get like in the case of customers, a nested grid that shows all the orders for them. So uh, that's super convenient. You don't have to go in there and manually add all of that. Wait for this to finish. Yes, I would like to start the server. That's everything it made for me, including a A5W page for the tab UI that was generated. I do want to start the server. And you'll notice here all the, the grids are prefixed with Northwind. Uh, grids have a metadata file uh, that we keep around so that you can recreate your grid from Life Preview. Uh, in case you you something happens, you've published it up there. I believe the metadata comes back down. Either that or that's what we publish. Um, I should probably actually go look into that again. And then this is what we get. So it says generated with Flying Start Genie. The Home tab is always open on a tab UI. And then we have over here the 
the the components it's generated for us. So here's customers, and these these are the customers. And my I can click up here. I can search on all that information. I can navigate to a different page. And if I click on this arrow, it shows me all the related data for this customer. So in this case, it's orders. And so orders have order items. So if I come down here and expand the third one, it's going to pull up all the order items for that. And if you come over here to orders and order details, these are the same tables that were embedded. So that's the orders, order details. So these show the order details for them. So I, it's it's really actually quite, quite, um, let's look at employees. It's really kind of cool what you can get out of this, so. That is pretty cool. It's been yeah. in the product a while, and it's one of those overlooked really cool features. That's, yeah, uh, I think I think the utility of like some of the stuff that it does, like it only picks the first five fields of your database. You don't have that much control, but once you've created those things, it's it's very easy to come back here and go into like right, there's just grids at that point. Yeah. yeah, and say yeah, create a backup here. Uh, go over to fields and be like, uh, you know, I don't really, I don't really want that. I want company name. I don't need this. Maybe I want, you know, their city and their country, and then you save that, and then that's it. That's all the work you have to do. We'll go take a, a live preview here. That's going to show those um, show that information now. So yeah, it's a very quick way to get set up with a uh, web app with the goal of doing some sort of backend, um, you know, product management for things you sell or you know, here it's just customers and orders and, and shipping and stuff like that. So everything you would need is right there with the grid. And it's very quick, but again, um, web only, these events here, and the reason it's, it's web only is because the events that are implemented for the grid are mouse keyboard events. There's no touch events that have been built into this thing. So that's why you really don't want to use this in a mobile environment. Cool. Um, let's see what else we've got here. Do you have more in your presentation or should we jump into questions? Oh, we should jump into questions. My presentation was quite short. <laughs> well, no, that's, that's quite fine. Thanks for that. You know, I don't want to, yeah. you know, it, it was short, but it was also like, it was a lot. Um, yeah. Where's my slideshow? Okay, you know, we, so... we covered a lot. We covered, uh, you know, all these components. Cool. We've got some component questions here, as, as it turns yeah. out. So um, here's one which says, what's the best strategy? to migrate your existing application from the tab UI to the new UX tab UI? That's an interesting question, how to migrate over to a UX tab UI. Yeah. Um, you know, the easiest way to start with that would be build your, your UX tab layout that you want, mm -hmm. and then add in each component uh, or report or whatever it is that you want uh, in that in that, re, uh, I don't want to say report. What do I want to into say? The, into the UX. Into the layout, into the yeah. UX. Yeah. yeah. And then and piecemeal, you know, test it. Um, Can you give us a quick, uh, show us the where the tabbed mm -hmm, UI replacement is located, how to get to it, and how to create a new one? So I'm going to go new web component UX. And I don't know if I'd necessarily say tab UI replacement. That seems to imply that we're getting rid of the tab UI in my mind. And uh, I've heard the term as well, but it's yeah. a, uh, alter we'll call it an alternative. It's think. an alternative way to display your data. And there's there's two ways to do this. There's the way that uses panels, and then there's um, the tab control mm -hmm. and tab pane. And so, uh, let's see tab pane. I so now the tab one. UI is not a great choice. Yeah mobile is that correct doesn't have the yeah tab ui isn't going to work great yeah. in mobile it's going to be that that tabbed uh it's going to be this interface where things open up to the side and as you can imagine your screen real estate is get going very, to disappear very fast because this yeah. is going to consume the majority of your screen so if you had a microscope and a stylus you'd be okay but uh beyond that, maybe uh yeah. we're, we're assuming that the stylus could be used to interact with these elements <laughs> that's a great point they wouldn't you know i, I touch. the touch yeah. the touch yeah. support in the tab ui is um you know sketchy at best it's not it wasn't designed for mobile so but you on the other hand ux is so presumably these tab and accordion controls would work okay on mobile mm -hmm. if you decide it that way so 
Right. right. So if you've got a like a tab UI where you've got things that are always open, the tab according control is certainly a way to go. Uh, but the other option is to do a panel navigator. And I'm just going to insert a few panel cards the manual way, manual way here. Mm -hmm. So after, uh, and let's add in a text, static text here. Panel one. And then I like to use control D. It's my favorite hotkey because it lets me duplicate something. And then we'll go over here and we'll change this to panel two. Click OK. And duplicate that again. This is just so we can tell um, what panel card we're looking at. Otherwise, there's no way to tell that things have been navigated. Because the screen will just be white. We'll make this panel three. So the panel navigator has uh, something called the navigator type property, and this dictates how it's displayed. Uh, carousel, like you can like swipe to basically swipe through things, like a carousel going around in a circle. But it has a few other options, including tab band, tab buttons, uh, list, uh, programmatic, so you can programmatically change it, and then orientation change. Uh, I haven't played with that much, so we will not talk about it. But I believe if you do tab band. It shows, um, there you go. It's going to show your panels across the top. So there we go, like that. And if you take this a step further, so that's how you set up the tabs. You step, take a step, step flirt further, blah, put it in a panel layout. So I selected everything and I added a panel layout around that whole thing. And then add one more panel card on the side here. And then let's just put in a button. Let's call it customers. Let's give it a sub theme of primary so it, it stands out a bit. Click OK. And then hook this up. To open a component, we're going to open a grid component because we just made a whole bunch of those. But please keep in mind that grid components are not mobile friendly. We'll go down here. We'll pick our customers grid for the the grid type, we'll click OK. And down here, the target, we don't want to open it in a window. We want to open it in a, I believe, dynamic panel. And then we tell it the panel navigator one is where we want to open it. And then we'll give it a, a, a name, a title, customers. And we'll ignore that part. And we'll say, yeah, you can close that. And we'll set focus, which is the behavior you have in the tab UI. You click on the button, it opens the panel and gives it focus, basically. And then we'll click OK. Open customers. Save that. And then the last thing I'm going to do is give this a layout size, just so it doesn't consume half the screen, 200 pixels. Um, if you don't give a layout size to panels and you put multiple panels within another, like a panel layout or panel nav, well, specifically a panel layout, uh, it's going to split the width evenly between them, uh, which is why you I'm going to give this guy a 200 pixels, which may be too big for what we need here. But let's go ahead and live preview that. So here's our panel card panel, you know, one, two, three over here on the that we already had. So, you know, this could just as easily say home. And then if we click customers, it's going to load it up here as another tab here on the end. And there's our customers, um, customers tab like we have in the tab UI. And it because all that embedded stuff is part of the grid, we have that behavior before where we could look at the, the orders for the customer. And if you close that, it has the same effect. It closes it like, like in the tab UI. You want more vertical space up here, so this is more in line. Uh, that's done easily by just, um, you know, you can insert, you can insert some padding at the top. You can tell it has some margin at the top. You can put a panel header in it, so that kind of stuff. I believe that is that helpful. That's very helpful. Thank you very All much right. for going over that. Uh, someone I just asked recently, you know, hey, you've got cool UX templates, but is there a way to see them because? Like if you say new template, there's a text list of them, mm -hmm. but is there a way to, to either see a sample of them 
in the IDE or maybe running as an example. And um, I don't think that's we do for either of them, but we actually have some pretty good documentation that I found that you probably put together <laughs> for that. Yes. And I pasted <laughs> that into the chat yeah. window. So and if fair warning, I haven't I haven't gotten them all in there yet, but I, you know, end goal is to have a documentation page for every single one of those examples. So all the things, uh, PhoneGap shell and the, mm -hmm. some, some of the security framework ones, the mobile app framework ones, they're all in there. And there are, um, in many cases, like for, uh, screenshots of them as well that you can see. Yeah, some and just to, to show people what that question is about, when you create a new UX component, click next, you have yeah. two options here at the top. You have blank UX and you have create from a template, which is this long laundry list of things down here. And you can add your own. So we have system templates, but if you had your own in here, you can save. Um, let's go back to this guy. I think it's save. Yeah, save as templates. So we could come down here and say like uh, my uh, tab replace the I tab UX. There we Alternative. Go. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Alternative tab UX, right? So I can give it a name, which will make it available in this list whenever I make a new UX. Give it a description. Descriptions are helpful to remind you what you did. Um, and then there's three places you can save them uh, in the current web project, in the workspace, which is different. So the web project is, um, we'll talk about that afterwards. So the web project is just the components in this project the workspace can have multiple projects in it and then there's a global template which would make it available to every single workspace that you create um but we'll just make this local for simplicity i'll find your demo q and a july 14 2021 there we go i'll call that template was saved and now if i go in here and i say new Web component UX, my local templates is down here at the bottom. So now if I make a new, if I select that, it's basically going to make um, a UX identical to this one. But that's where those uh, that's where those templates are. When you when you make these, there isn't a preview in here. Uh, there's a description. Uh, but the the best way to find out what they are really it's just to create it and then do like a, a live preview see what happens awesome and this one is showing my location <laughs> you are. it's not this is the push i didn't even look at which one i picked but this is like a pusher sample sample app yeah. to show you location reports so follow the instructions in here to get it set up you know get rid of these error messages and you're good to go Wow, you told everyone you were in California. You seem to be on the East Coast now, though. I'm not sure. Uh, was I in California? I'm not sure. Got a couple more cool questions, though. Uh, one is, uh, actually, let's start with this one. I'm going to start with one that has to do the um, with uh, creating AJAX callbacks. And so the question is this. They have got an AJAX callback, but they want to know, how do I pass the values of some of the controls to that callback? So maybe it's running an X basic function that's looking at, I don't know, latitude and longitude, and it's giving back a street address. If it's in that kind of API. Mm -hmm. um, how do you access within your function things that were entered in the screen of your UX? All right. So I heard UX. <laughs> Let's make a new UX. Yeah. And see how I'm going to add a few controls here. I'm just going to pick text boxes. Sure. Uh, Maybe we have a function that adds two values together and then gives you a value or something. Kind of. OK, yeah. Uh, value one, value two. And this is side note, I'm going to create multiple new controls at once. So there's this, um, this syntax you can use to add many text boxes. And you can click on this link to see some examples. Uh, the text you put in here is going to be the name of your control as well as the label. You can also populate it from a table if you want to do that. Uh, but we'll do value one and value two. I'll click OK and it'll add, generate those two controls for me. Let's just check to make sure they have labels. They do. Value one, position above, and then let's add a button, which I've put in my favorites. 
calculate. Primary is good. And then what calculate's gonna do is when it's clicked, we want to make an Ajax callback and submit that data. So we're gonna do a little bit of trial and error here. I'm gonna add an Ajax callback action JavaScript. I'm gonna give it a function name. Um, we'll just call it calculate. I'm gonna make the function prototype. I'm gonna copy it to the clipboard. I'm gonna click on open X basic function declarations and then paste it. And that X basic function declarations is this thing right here. And this is uh, just a place where you can add X basic functions used by your app. Click OK to save that. And I'm going to start by just clicking OK to see what we get. Uh, calculate sum and display. So right off the bat, the first thing I'm going to do is just put a debug one in here and take a look at the information that's already provided for us. So the the function, the Ajax callback function is past this E object. It's a, it's a pointer. It's got a whole bunch of properties on it. Some of them are arrays. It can get quite large. Um, and some of that data is data submitted. So data submitted is uh, the values from these controls on your UX if they've, if they've been edited uh, from their, I believe it only submits it if they've been edited, but let's go check it out in live preview. And that debug one statement, for those of you who don't know, will open the XBasic debugger when that function is run. So if I just click calculate on my side screen over here, which you didn't see, it popped open uh, the XBasic debugger. And this is that function. If we scroll up to the top here. This is that calculate function. There's our debug one statement. And at this point, I can do something down here in this variable watch expression area. And I could hit E and go look at what's inside that E object that we were provided. So you can see there's a few things in here. There's data submitted, which has value one and value two, which is great. Those are the controls that I want the data from. So if we let this run and then go back into design mode here, we can update our function to do um, a dim value one as and I'll do, a, I'm just going to do convert type on this uh, e data submitted dot value one. And we'll give it n as a requested type. And then dim value two as n convert type value two. And I'm doing convert type because I did not, I do not believe I set these up as number controls. So just to be on the safe side to make sure those are numbers. And then we'll hear uh, total as n equals value one plus value two. And then e, is it e JavaScript? I'm going to scroll down here and find it. No, it's not e JavaScript, just return. Ajax callback, you return the JavaScript you want to execute. So we'll go down here. After that debug one, we'll just say return. Well, first we'll go dim jsc equals alert value is, and I'm using an alert for simplicity. But this could just as easily be um, a JavaScript action, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. And to you know, call a JavaScript action, give it that value, or pass the value back as some variable, or set it in another control um, using the dialog that set value method, and then we'll return that JavaScript. Return JS. So let's let's save this real quick here. Call back demo. And I'm going to leave that debug one in here just to make sure that um, the calculation that we've got above is correct. Let's do 12 and 10. So we should get an alert. This is 22. We'll click calculate. 
and let's look at values. So value one, if you double click these, it will add them, the, the variable name. So value one is 12, value two is 10. If I double click on total, total is 22. I'm gonna step and then look at the JS here to make sure I generated it correct. And I did not. If you look in there, you can see there's three uh, single quotes. So that's that's not going to do what we want. That's actually going to cause a JavaScript problem. But I'm going to click Run anyway. And uh, we didn't see an error because it, it failed silently. But if we come back in here, I'll just delete that single quote because we didn't need it. Let's say value is plus total end quote. And then live preview again. Twelve, ten, calculate this step. So that looks good. So now when we run this, we should see value is 22. So the data from those controls is already being sent back in the callback. So there isn't anything you need to do, do in that case. Um, that being said, there are situations where you do need to do extra work to get data from this UX component sent in your callback. And there are um, there are some settings in here that'll do it for you, and then there's some things that you need to do yourself. So uh, the submit data from list controls will submit the data in the list if that's what you need on the back end. Uh, checking that will submit all the data from your lists. We don't have any lists in here, so that's not gonna demo well. Um, but there's also a setting to submit your location information. So if you are wanting to capture someone's location when they do something with the callback, you can check that box and you'll have the latitude and the longitude value will be sent uh, back in the um, in these values. It explains it down here, location, found, true, false, latitude, and longitude. But those will be in the uh, E object. And mm -hmm. you'll definitely want to check to see if the location was found before you make any assumptions about the latitude and longitude values. Right. And then you can also use this additional data to submit to call a JavaScript function that calculates the values to submit back. And those are passed as page variables on the on the callback. Great. Uh, so the latitude and longitude, that is just using the H HTML5 as the underlying technology for capturing that, right? It isn't using PhoneGap or anything like that? It's, it's not required for this? Or, sorry, Cordova? I believe I believe this uses the HTML5 to capture the information. Um, right. I'm not 100% sure if we just use the the Cordova library if we detect that you're in a mobile environment. That that's a good question though. We could look into that further. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because we did have a related question, which someone was interested in capturing uh, location data like said in mm -hmm. the background. Um, okay. Which means actually, which can mean one of two different things. I mean, it right. can mean uh, while the app is running without okay. the user, after they've given permission for the app to do whatever it's going to do, um, right. the app silently captures it without posting an alert and, mm -hmm. and records it someplace. And then the other way of doing it is when your app is closed, still as a background process, it's possible to capture GPS data. So it's those are the two options. The first one is easier. Uh, it is easier. Um, yeah, but they're but they're both doable. So um, that I just want to bring that up as uh, someone had asked that question. If they want to send us an email to guides g u i d e s at alpha software dot com, we would be happy to investigate that. We have a couple people here who would know the answer, the best way to accomplish that for their app. Yeah. Well, and in respect to the capturing location information while someone is moving around, we do have a mapping and geocoding ah. actions, and one of those is this thing called. Um, I think this is it, geolocation information. And um, in here, you can set up, I think update data on location change. Uh, you can you can do the capturing with this, this action. It will, uh, it requires HTML5 compatible um, browser, Which but as the user know. moves around, it yeah. will update information. And I, I believe with the Cordova apps, it's, it's a given. So I think that's the one you use for capturing location. Right. And we that's not Cordova dependent. No. So one of the other questions right. is, does this work on 
iOS and Android or just Android. And I think we had a version of something that only worked on iOS, but there are definitely ways of capturing for both iOS and Android. Yeah, there are ways to capture it for sure. Yeah. I'm not seeing it in here. Um, so yeah, we would have to look into that further to answer that definitively. Right, okay. Yeah, right. So if it's working in the background, again, we'll, we'll need to bring in our are very smart Cordova people who will yes. who can answer that question. Um, wonderful. Okay, so here's another question. So I'm gonna actually ask this one first, but we, I think we'll have time to get to it. This person has built a UX and in the UX, they have a list with a detailed view. And the detailed view is on a different panel than the list is on. It's a pretty typical way I would say of setting it up. Right. So they want when they get to the detail view sometimes in the detail view they want to see these two buttons one's called new record and one's called delete record because that makes sense to have those there but if they got to that page because they clicked on a button which said add new record then those new record and delete record buttons really don't make any sense right so no. the question is yeah. if you got a button could you make a button sort of uh, that brings you to that tab and hides those two buttons? And then when you're done, presumably uh, when you save the record or cancel or I don't know, leave the panel, something like that, um, uh, have the have the controls come back? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, let's just quickly build out. Uh, oh, not that. It sounds like they're using a panel navigator, and two panel cards and the first one has a list and I'm going to just grab the list out of my favorites here uh, I'll call it list one well let's create a new single control quickly set this up against our favorite Northwind demo database and we'll go with customers because that's the one we're familiar with and fields let's get all the fields and Give it a detail view. All the fields enclose detail view in nothing because I'm going to actually put it down here in panel card two after it gets generated. And I'm going to click OK. And then this is my list. I'm going to grab all of these controls and I'm going to move them to a specific location. I'm going to select panel card two. I'm going to say after the opening panel card two. So that'll move them down into panel card two. And then for the sake of demonstration, I'm just going to put a panel footer on here uh, with no control bar. And that's where I'm going to put all these buttons. So they're visible on, on every screen. And I'm going to use that move again, select my panel footer. OK, so that puts those guys down there. And I'll have this guy fill the container. And then there's one more thing we have to do, and that is we need to add. Um, well, first I'm going to simplify this a little bit so they are easier to read. Don't need region. Don't need phone. Don't need fax. And then on the list events, I'm going to go to. On select, I could just as easily search for select here to filter this out. And in here, I'm going to put a Java. Uh, I'm going to insert a method today. Search for panel. We use panel set active. I'm going to insert it. Delete all this um, text in between the parentheses because it's placeholder text. And then if you start typing, you should get this pop-up thing. And then if you right click here, you can say panel card two is where I want to go. And I believe that's all we need to do here. And I'm going to leave the, the navigator on carousel so I can just click drag to go back to the list. Um, but let's, let's quick take a quick look at what we've got here. And then I'll show you how you can hide those buttons. Um, when you're in a new record mode. So you see down here, everything is in uh, 
grayed out. I guess. Yeah, it's grayed out. Uh, you know, if I click here, it goes over. I can click drag to go back. If I click new record, it won't navigate because I didn't add that. Um, but we'll do new record here. And you can still see the delete. And I believe the op uh, request was to hide this if you're in yes. a. Yes. So let's say to hide the delete record, for example. So if, if you notice here, um, it's already grayed out, which means there's something that's already happening uh, to do that. So if we go back and we look at that delete record button that was generated for us, and if you scroll down, there's a section called client side properties. And it's got a few properties in here, including a show hide expression and an enable expression. And that enable expression is what's making it um, active or inactive. You can actually, you know, if, if the behavior you want is it to be completely hidden, uh, you can just come in here and copy this. And then go over to the show hide expression in the same section and apply it. Mm. And now it's not going to be there. In fact, it's not even going to be there if we don't have any records selected. So you can see that that's gone. Now, if I click on something, it's going to show up. If I click on new record, it disappears because we're in cool. new record mode. And unfortunately, the I should have added the code to navigate to new record, but I didn't. Um, so that's how you can do that. If you've generated those uh, buttons programmatically, if you're adding them manually, um, all you need to do is you need to add a, a test for the list detail view and then which list and its mode. And here the delete record is only shown if, if we're not searching and there's a row selected in the list, meaning that something has been selected to edit. When you add a new record, nothing is selected. So um, you can get at these fields down here in this insert fields list. And if you scroll down, there's going to be a list mode. Um, you know, list is dirty and it's going to list that list one. If you have more than one list in here, I believe it lists all of them for you. But that's what you need to add. And you need to use this show hide expression on the client side properties for that. Awesome. Thanks very much. Someone else has pointed out, uh, I think something that I don't, didn't have ever used. Uh, and that is that apparently if you right click on the list control, you probably don't already do this. Right click on the list control, it'll allow you to add in a bunch of cards all at once. So you don't necessarily have to add them at the same time. I think you have to be one above it. So right now on list. Right click on this? Uh, the one above it, the panel card. And the one above that uh, for panels. Yeah, here it is. Um, add panel, the green one. Yep. Oh, add panel. Yeah, and then say panel card, and say after. We'll cancel at the end, and then you decide. Oh, am I going to have oh, five panel cards? You just do five. Oh, is that new to you too? I'm amazed. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I never pay attention to the context menu because it's it's one of those things that's in presentations you have to say I'm right clicking. Uh, yeah, exactly. So maybe it's obvious to some folks. Um. That is cool. All right. But you know, this is that stuff's over here too. So we, we have quick panels. You can use this to do the same thing. You can do that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, hey great comment. That's cool. Yeah. That's, uh, I learned a thing. I learned a thing too. Wow. Yeah. I don't know when they stuck that in, but it's perfect. Uh, there's, uh, there's so many things in here. <laughs> <laughs> there really are. It looks like we have jumped through all of the questions. So if anyone has a question we didn't get to today or have a question after our webinar, go ahead and send it to guides at alphasoftware.com. That's monitored by a team of people here. And we're happy to get you an answer to that question. Sarah, thank you very much for presenting. Uh, next week, I believe Dion McCormick will be back to do a session. Mm -hmm. And uh, we hope to see you all there. Until then, stay well and take care. Bye-bye.